I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. A <laughs> little Miss Honey, how are you today? Happy as a lark. Oh, and what a beautiful lark. Thank you. And how are you? Just full of joy bubbles. Oh, oh, that's wonderful. How did you get that way? Oh, when everybody is happy and laughing, I just... And the joy bubbles go inside me. What? What? Well, here, I'll show you. Laugh. What should I laugh at? Laugh because you're happy. Oh, all right. <laughs> now I sniff. <laughs> See? I sniffed, and the joy bubbles went right inside me. <laughs> yes, that's wonderful. Now, will you please read me the funny? Puck the Comic yes. Weekly? Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. Hoppy and his pals have escaped from the Rock Mesa and have trailed Sloat the outlaw to the town of Buckskin. They find a big crowd there. A man named Higgins is telling the sheriff, When I made camp about midway between Soda Creek and El Paso, by morning my money belt was gone, sheriff. The sheriff asks, well, who else knew you were toting 5000 in cash, Newt? Last picture of the row, the man named Newt Higgins replies, Why, nobody. I drew the cash from the bank, left town quiet-like. Not a living soul followed me. The sheriff says, Are you sure you didn't notice anything peculiar? First picture, next row, Higgins answers, Only that I was all fired drowsy just for a bed of down. The sheriff grunts, huh. Same old story. Well, I'll send a posse to look around. One of the men remarks that it must be these ghost raiders again. California says, first picture, top row. Hey, suppose Sloat's tied in with whoever's behind his hoppy? Hoppy answers, we'll know that after we find Sloat. <coughs> Meanwhile, at this moment, upstairs in the doctor's office, Sloat looks out the window and sees Hoppy. <coughs> he exclaims, hey, Cassidy and his two pards are down there, Doc. How in blue thunder could they have escaped from that rock maze? <coughs> Doc Wiley tells Sloat he better get out of there before Hoppy finds him. First picture next row, he says. Here, take this money belt. There's 5,000 in it. Enough to keep you till things blow over. Use my rig, parked out back. Hit the south trail. Hurry! Sloat escapes in the Doc's buggy by the back way. Wiley smiles and watches him drive off. Our first picture, bottom row, and calls. Oh, Sheriff! A stranger with a wounded arm just held me up, stole my rig, and headed toward the south trail. Lucky exclaims, hey, sounds like Sloat. The sheriff says, well, I'd round up a posse, Doc, but the boys are all out gunning for those ghost raiders. Wiley answers last picture. Then somebody better start gunning for this man. He was wearing Newt Higgins' money belt. With each other. Yes, Sloat tried to chisel in on Doc Wiley's racket, and now Wiley is trying to get Sloat shot by the sheriff. I wonder whether Hoppy will go along with the sheriff after Sloat. Well, we'll find that out next week. Well, now let's turn over the page and see what's happening with Prince Val. Yes, please, because Val had come back to see Arf, and when he got there, he learned that Arf only had one leg. Yes, and naturally, Arf is very, very unhappy about that. Yes, because Arf had hoped to become a great hero and a famous knight. I wonder what Val's going to do. Well, let's read now and find out. So here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckett, Gray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Arthur survived the loss of one of his frozen feet. But it seems as if he'll not outlive his shattered dream. He has no will to live now that he cannot become a great warrior, a knight champion. He asks bitterly, Who ever heard of a one-legged knight? 
Bell says sharply, I have. Last picture, top row, Arf looks up in surprise at Prince Valiant. Never had his warm-hearted chief spoken so sharply. Val repeats, I have. The youth who is arrow maker to King Arthur has but one leg. Gunder Harl, the great Norse shipbuilder, has only one leg and one arm. Arf stares at Val, pain written all over his face to hear his hero speak so sharply to him. First picture, next row, Val turns away that he may not see the hurt in the boy's eyes. Val says, We still have much work to do ere we return home. And then Val walks out of the room without looking back at Arf. His heart hurts within him for having caused pain to the boy he loves so much. But he knows the only way to make Arf forget his misery is to make him believe that he still can be a man among men, even though he has only one leg. Val says to the doctor, Watch him closely, doctor. Report any change in his condition. The hours drag by. But finally, last picture, second row, the doctor returns to Val, who's been taking a nap. The doctor's face beams, and he says, Oh, he cried like a tired child until he slept. But when he woke, a change had taken place. For he said, Tell my chief I am ready to do what I may. Quickly, Val goes to Arf. First picture, bottom row, Arf looks up as his chief enters. Val grins at him and then says, Well, you've been quite a responsibility. But now you can be of great help. Lady Alita and I have taught you to read and write, so take these notes I've kept and write a full report of our mission for the king. Get busy, secretary. And then he rumples up the lad's hair and is gone. There's a long silence while hoofbeats fade into the distance. Last picture, Arf shouts, Bring me parchment, inkhorn, and quills. I've got work to do. Val even had me fooled. I thought he was being cruel to Arf and, and wasn't sorry for him. Well, Val was very sorry and felt very badly, but he knew he had to make Arf believe in himself and believe that his life wasn't ruined. Yes, and it worked, too, because look how happy Arf is now. He knows now that he can still be of service. Oh, yes, indeed. You know, the greatest bravery isn't always shown when you're a fighter. Why, sometimes the bravest people are those who have to sit and wait because it takes courage not to become disheartened. Yes, it does. I thought I would never get over the measles, but I did. And now look at me. I am, and I think you're lovely. Thank you. You're welcome. Now? No, now is the time for Donald Duck. He always does such silly things. I want to see what silly things he does today. Well, let's turn over the page. And there he is in the middle of page five. And here we go with Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze him, squeeze him, squiddy chicka chack. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald's explaining a bright idea to his nephews, Louie, Huey, Dewey. They go out to their car, each carrying a pail of cloths. Donald says, We gotta hurry. It'll be dark in half an hour. And they jump in the car and drive away. They arrive at the road to the Ajax Drive-In Theater. Lots of cars are driving into the theater. Donald races up and down the road past the other cars kicking up clouds and clouds of dust. The drivers of the other cars scowl furiously at Donald, but he pays no attention to them and races up and down the road again, stirring up clouds and clouds of dust. Fourth picture, top row, Donald says, How do we do? Dewey answers, you better make the run once more to be sure. So down the road they go once more, stirring up more clouds of dust. Dewey looks back and sees the air is full of dust and says cheerfully, That's better. First picture bottom row, they stop their car. Donald says, Okay. Get out the equipment while I put up the sign. So he hammers a sign on a board fence. And then he says, 
Okay, boys, we're in business. Last picture, an hour and a half later, a line of cars is parked in front of Donald's sign, which says, Windshields Watch, 25 cents. And Donald, Huey, and Dewey, and Louie are hard at work washing the windshields of the cars that are coming out of the drive-in theater. And the motorists are annoyed at the money their dirty windshields is costing them. And Donald, cheerful as a chipmunk at the money he's making, sings as he works. Wash your windshields for a quarter so you can see the road to drive like you want <laughs> Donald did have a good, a good skin, didn't he? Yes. There ain't so much dust on the road that the windshields of all the cars got dirty. And then when they came out, they saw Donald's sign, and Donald made the money by washing the dirt off all the windshields on the cars. Yes, the dirt that he got on those cars himself. It really wasn't fair, but it was very funny. I quite agree. <laughs> now is the time for Dagwood and Blondie? It certainly is. Oh, and here they are on the first page of the second section. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zam, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood's doorbell rings. He goes to open it, and a homely looking man says, Oh, I'm selling men some wallets. Dagwood replies, I don't need a wallet, and starts to close the door. But the man sticks his foot and arm through and tries to push the door open, saying, yeah, But they're genuine cowhide. Dagwood tries to push the door closed and says, No, I say, and I mean it. But he can't get the door closed, so he quickly jerks it open. The man stumbles on Dagwood, saying, They come in two colors, uh, black and tan. Dagwood throws him out, saying, No! He slams the door shut and locks it. First picture next row, saying, Huh, I finally got rid of him and locked the door. <sighs> and he turns around, and there's the salesman who says, uh -huh. You forgot your back door was unlocked. Dagwood picks him up. And last picture, second row, runs for the back door with him. The salesman says, It fits all tight pockets. First picture, next row, Dagwood throws him out the door. <laughs> Dagwood says, ah, I'm exhausted, but I won. I'm the winner. He slams the door shut, locks it, and says... My victory of man over salesman is complete. I've got both doors locked. But the salesman, undaunted, starts ringing the doorbell again. Dagwood says, last picture of the row, let him keep ringing that doorbell. I'll celebrate my victory with a nice hot bath to soothe my jangled nerves. First picture, bottom row, Blondie comes home. The salesman, who is still waiting on the front steps, holds out his wallets and says politely, Oh, uh, how do you do, lady? Would you like to buy a wallet for your husband? Blondie smiles and... A few minutes later, Dagwood is lying in the bathtub thinking how cleverly he had outsmarted the salesman. Suddenly, the bathroom door opens and the salesman sticks his head in and says, Hey, buddy... I just wanted to tell you, I sold your wife a wallet. <laughs> Dagwood moans, oh no. The salesman slams the door shut, and Dagwood is alone again with his memories. Suddenly, a tear trickles down Dagwood's face and drops in the water, and then another, and then another, until... And then Blondie opens the door, last picture, holding the wallet in her hand, and she says cheerfully that she didn't know that Dagwood was taking a bath. And Dagwood, whose head is just barely out of the water, sobs. <laughs> Some of it's bath water, <laughs> but most of it's tears. <laughs> well, why is he crying? After all, the salesman didn't sell him the wallet. No, but Blondie spent his money. Oh, oh yes, poor Dagwood. After all that work, the salesman outsmarted him. <laughs> yep, it looks like Dagwood just can't win. No. Now, look, here's Roy Rogers, our niece, Dagwood. Will you please read that? I'll read that in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Uh. 
Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on page one of the second section, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Hi yip hi yo. Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. Hi yip hi yo. <laughs> Roy has heard that someone was seen riding Trigger Jr. Down the trail Roy goes, burning leather. He says, Stretch Trigger! The Rawhide Sheriff's right about seeing a strange hombre riding Trigger Jr. We're trailing a horse thief. As he nears the railroad tracks, he exclaims, Hey, sounds like home. That's old 88 pulling the grade. Hey, maybe Pete the engineer can tell me what's wrong at the Devil R Bar. From the top of the grade... Roy sees below a masked man on Trigger Jr. flagging the train. As the train stops, the masked man reaches for his gun, but it's stuck, and he says, "Uh, Reach for the sky. Uh, This is a holdup, I think. The engineer, seeing the fumbling bandit, laughs last picture top row. (laughs) What's the matter, Jesse James? You got fish hooks on that (laughs) six-shooter? And the fireman says... Yeah, take your time. We ain't in no hurry. The bandit says, uh, Gun seems to be stuck. The engineer laughs. The bandit first picture bottom row says, I'll teach you to laugh at killer, Monty. Suddenly a shot rings up. The bandit yelps, Hey, help! The shot frightens Trigger Jr. and he bucks the bandit off. At this moment, Roy gallops up. The engineer exclaims, Hi, hey, Joe, that's Roy Rogers. They lift the bandit to his feet, and the engineer tells Roy, This dang tenderfoot was trying to hold up the train, Roy, but he couldn't get his shooting iron out. (laughs) Roy gets off trigger, saying, Well, I got a few questions to ask this, hombre. Last picture, Roy confronts the bandit, saying, Now, first, let's find out how come you're riding Trigger Jr. and wearing one of my hats. The bandit trembles, saying, Please, Mr. Rogers, it's it's, it's all, all, all a mistake. That was very funny. Can you imagine that man saying, this is a holdup, I think? (laughs) (laughs) It certainly is funny. Oh, I'm anxious to find out who that man is. He's so silly. He is. And I'm mighty happy that Roy got Trigger Jr. back again because I was really worried. He's such a beautiful horse. Oh, isn't he, though? Well, next week we'll find out more about this bandit who has glue on his fingers. Good. Is this the time we read Flash Gordon? I think it is. So let's turn over the page. And there he is, Flash Gordon. Oh, and this is really getting serious because you remember Flash is on the moon. Yes, trying to find out who was firing the meteors at Earth. And then he discovered a lot of beetle men were ruled by that Earth man named Rock. And last week, Rock captured Flash, Dale, and Professor Bright. So let's be quick and see what he's going to do. Very well. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. Flash, Dale, and Professor Bright, their hands bound behind them and guarded by the Beetlemen, listen as Rock, the mad scientist who preceded Flash's party to the moon, dooms them to death on its airless surface. He boasts, You will never return to the Earth to warn them of my plans. I'm going to destroy the Earth with my meteor gun. When Rock turns away for a moment, Flash whispers to Dale, I think I can work loose from these spun glass bonds, but if I fail, our end will be quick and painless. Dale gazes at him tenderly and murmurs that she isn't afraid because they'll be together. Last picture top row, while Flash is struggling with the ropes, the guard has changed, and the new sentry tells him by telepathy... I'm the moon man you caught and then freed. You are good. Rock is evil. I, Cor, was king of the moon men before Rock came from Earth and made us slaves. First picture, bottom row. Cor melts the spun glass bindings. Glass says, Give me the torch. I'll free Dale and Professor Bright. Dale is nervous for the first time and pleads for them to hurry. After releasing Dale, Flash goes to work on Professor Bright's bonds. Suddenly, last picture, a secret door opens in the side of the cavern, and Rock appears, blazing away with a ray gun he captured from Flash. The first blast stuns Kor, the moon man. Rock draws a bead on Flash and shouts, Surrender or die! (laughs) 
Oh, dear, and just as Flash was about to get free. Yes, I thought he was going to escape and would be free to fight Rock on equal terms again. And here, Rock is aiming right at Flash. You think you'll be killed? Well, next week we'll find out. All right. Now is it time for Dick's adventure? You remember an English officer named Major Andre had come to the fort that was commanded by General Benedict Arnold? Oh, yes, and he'd come under pretense of exchanging prisoners of war. Yes, but I think something else is happening. I think there's some crooked work. I think maybe you're right. Just as Dick was returning, Major Andre to the ship... The guns at the fort saw the English ship in the river and began firing at it. And, and morning came, and Major Andre said to Dick, Hide me, quick. I wonder what's going to happen. Well, let's read right now and find out. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Although perplexed with suspicions of treason, Dick obeys orders and is conducting British Major Andre back to his waiting ship just below West Point. When suddenly, at dawn, the colonial American cannons start thundering. Andre cries in alarm. Hide me, Sergeant. This shelling is preventing my return to my ship. I'm carrying valuable information regarding the exchange of prisoners of war. Realizing he has already blurted out too much to his alert Yankee escort, Andre, last picture top row, demands Dick report back to General Arnold to halt the firing. At first picture next row, the cannonading stops, and for an excellent reason. The British sloop has weighed anchor and is scuttling down the Hudson to safety, with the result that Major Andre now finds himself abandoned. Last picture, second row, within the American lines. He exclaims, I'll be captured. General Arnold must get me back. Leaving the frightened enemy officer in temporary shelter, Dick hastens back to West Point. Dick reports to General Benedict Arnold, who listens, his face tense. Then he decides. He scribbles something on a paper, then says to Dick, Row him down the river until you reach the house I've noted here. At nightfall, row me across, close to the British lines. Dick carries out General Arnold's orders, rowing Major Andre across the river. Andre keeps his British uniform hidden under a greatcoat. Dick says meaningfully, Our men treat captured soldiers in uniform well, but disguised in civilian clothes, they hang them as spies, sir. look really worried about this. Yes, they do. And I think that's suspicious, too, because if they had nothing to be guilty about, why would they be worried? You know, that's good detective work. Thank you. What does Dick mean about the clothes? Well, if you're captured wearing your soldier's uniform, you'll be treated just as a British, uh, or rather as a prisoner of war, fed and put in a sort of jail. But if you're a soldier and you're caught wearing street clothes, civilian clothes, then you can be hanged as a spy. Oh. Oh, no wonder Andre's worried. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll find out more about what's going to happen next week. All right. Now, will you please read me Rusty Rally? Here he is, right on the Dick's Adventures. You remember last week, Rusty and Tex got away from that island by using that locomotive. Yes, but Smith has followed them across the trestle. And Tex told Rusty that he was going to fight Smith. Yes, and then you remember, too, that the man in the tower saw him through the spyglass, and he's called the sheriff. I hope the sheriff gets there before anything bad happens to Tex. Well, let's read right now and find out with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> As Tex approaches Smith, Smith pulls off his coat, saying, I'm giving you one more chance. Give me that paper, and you and the boy won't get hurt. But I want those plans. Tex replies, Smith, you're more loco than I thought. If you figure I'll help you get away with a military secret without a fight, just try to get it. Rusty ties Big Blaze to a tree, saying, oh, Easy, Blaze, don't get excited. I'm going to tie you to this tree, because I might have to help Tex. And then he runs toward Tex. Smith closes in on him. Third picture, top roll. Rusty watches him, sees Tex swing and miss. Rusty exclaims, He's too clever for Tex. He ducked that left like a real boxer. And suddenly he sees Smith pick up a rock and hit Tex with it. Uh, uh. Rusty exclaims, last picture, top row. Oh, golly, he's knocked Tex out with a rock. 
Smith, you stop that. And he runs up to Smith, first picture, bottom row, saying angrily, What kind of a coward are you to hit a man with a rock? Smith snarls, Get back on those woods, kid, or I'll finish you off, too. At this moment, a voice rings out. You ain't gonna finish off nothing, bud. Drop that rock. Now, just what's going on here? Rusty sees it's the sheriff and the state police. The sheriff walks up saying, I'm the sheriff, and I'm arresting you all for stealing the locomotive. The state trooper leans over Tex and asks, And yeah, what's wrong with this man? Rusty exclaims, Well, that other man knocked him out with a rock. Tex rubs his head and slowly sits up, last picture. The state trooper says, Now, this guy's okay. He was just knocked out. Rusty looks around quickly and then exclaims, Hey, there he goes! Golly, he's starting the engine! Oh, my goodness. While they were all looking at Tex, that mean crook Smith slipped away. Yes, and if they don't move fast, he's apt to get that train started and escape. I wonder whether Rusty took those secret plans with him or, or whether they're on the train. Well, that's something we'll find out next week. My, I can hardly wait. Oh, you've got lots of other funnies to read until you see me. Barney Google, Jungle Jim, The Lone Ranger, The Phantom. And I'll read them all, too. And I'll see you, too, next week, Mr. Connie Geekly Man. And I'll be looking for you. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice man with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Comic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.